<laughs> good evening. Good evening. Welcome back to Film Society. You, you uh, definitely seem to attract a good crowd. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> Are they good? <laughs> so congratulations on the, the, the movie um, coming out next, starts, opens next week. Just by the way, I'll plug that probably a couple of times. Um, I remember actually, I, and, and if memory serves me correct, um, it was maybe about a year ago or maybe a little over a year ago that I saw the first image that came out. Uh, I was actually working at a movie website at the time called Movie Line, and it was the first image of the stars. Um, almost, to, It seems like they're on the verge of a, of a passionate smooch, um, and that caused quite a stir. Um, and, 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 and that was like got the people talking about the movie. Do you remember, was that, was that was something that you, you said, let's put this image out and... and uh, no. Get, no? <laughs> was that a surprise to you, too? <laughs> well, it's known as exploitation. Right. <laughs> so maybe just kind of talk about sort of how, what were sort of the roots of this, of this project and just kind of maybe give a little bit more of a sense of what, what the story is centered on. Well, this is based on the Alan Curnow film uh, Love Crime, and uh, the producer... Uh, took it to uh, Toronto and he was approached by um, a lot of uh, uh, producers and uh, distributors to make an um, English version. And he said, well, if everybody's so interested, uh, I'll make the English version. So he uh, was an admirer of mine and he sent the Corneau film to me and I saw ways I thought to make it more mysterious. And I didn't like the fact that Corneau revealed that uh, 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 Isabel is the killer right at the murder. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I wanted to keep that more mysterious, to keep the audience guessing right to the end. But what was it? Obviously, that film, the Alan Corneau film, struck you. And what about it was like just well, gave you the broad Well, I like the relationship interest. between the two women. I like the way they were manipulating each other. Uh, and in his film, it's a little subtle in the sense that they're kind of playing. The girls played it a lot more intense. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they took the sort of flirtation and backstabbing uh, a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. Was that, but you were totally fine with that and encouraged Absolutely. that perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> they had a whole idea how to do this. So they had you know, worked together in, uh, in uh, Sherlock Holmes too. Uh, they liked working together, and they liked playing together. It's like two really good fence fencers. Right. So what, how did they become involved with the film, and at what point? Well, I was talking Rachel to... Rachel McAdams and Numi... Help me with the pronunciation. Numi Rapace? Rapace. Rapace. Uh, I was uh, talking to another director who had been talking to Numi about his film, and he said, you have to uh, consider this actress. I'd obviously seen her dragon movies, mm -hmm. But he gave me all these movies where she's playing a lot more vulnerable character. These all these movies that were in Swedish, with no subtitles, but you could see what a terrific performance it was. So uh, we sent the script to Numi, and she liked it. And fortunately, uh, she had just worked with Rachel, and these actresses like working together. So suddenly, Rachel wanted to play, you know. The Christine part, and then we had a cast. Mm -hmm. Did you did you see a lot of actresses beforehand, or was that they just yes, sort of we, automatically? We, yeah, we had other people interested in playing Isabel, but I couldn't find actresses that wanted to play the bitchy Christine. <laughs> the bitchy I would think that crazy. that would be quite popular, actually, the bitchy Christine. Yeah, <laughs> I mean those those are the fun parts to play, but I guess I don't know. Everybody wants to be loved. Well. <laughs> Rachel had no problem being not loved. Maybe give a little sense since you called her the bit, like the bitchy Christine. I'm going to go with that a little bit. So what, what about her is bitchy? Um, what, what, what will well, people see about yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does she have a twin sister? I don't know. You know, she's completely manipulative. And I, would mm -hmm. use, I used to laugh during her takes, especially the one where she goes completely nuts at home. She's throwing things around. The guy cancels out on her. She doesn't know what she's going to do. And then she's suddenly calling up an old boyfriend. And she says, you want to come over? <laughs> 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 uh, 
I, I, every time I see her, I do that line, and she, we laugh together. I mean, on the surface, she comes off as so sweet, and of course, just very stylish and obviously beautiful. Um, and then this this other side sort of like comes about, and that begins the whole some of the story whole story yeah. about the crazy twin sister. I mean, I you know. Nomi was crying. I mean, this whole ridiculous story about how she accidentally killed her twin sister that she uses to manipulate her. It, it was just uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I read somewhere you, and you're kind of alluding to it here, but I read somewhere that you call, you, you've actually described this movie as a bit manipulative. No um, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so I want, sorry, not, I don't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> Um, but maybe describe that a little bit, like what, give a little, well, give a little girl, hint, a little tease. the girls, I mean, I sort of, you know, let them take it as far as they could. Uh, like, for instance, that mafia kiss that she gives uh, Nomi. I mean, you know, she sort of prances over to her and says, uh, let's, m let's kiss and make up, you know? And then Nomi grabs her like the kiss of death, <laughs> you know, and really kisses her. And then it's, it, and she in order to respond to that, catches Danny in the doorway and kisses her back even harder. And this has just happened at the moment. I go, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> How did, I mean, this, this film had it, well, it's world premiere in Venice. How did people react when they first saw this, saw it on the screen? Well. <laughs> Well. Oh, well, okay. I thought you were saying, well, let me tell you. Okay, well, oh, okay. Well. They reacted well. All right, right on. Um, I want to see a clip, first clip we're going to show um, in a moment, so I'm just going to give that cue to the people upstairs to get it ready. Um, so, obviously, there's a lot of sexual tension, in, especially in the early scenes in the film. Um, how did you guys go about sort of working that in sort of the two, the two actresses? They, they, you know? they it just came whole, natural? They had a whole thing going. I mean... Like the, the, you know, that kiss in the car where she goes, and, you know, I want to be admired and I want to be loved. And she sort of looks at Nomi and Nomi kind of, well, what the hell does, what the hell does she mean by that? And then she kisses her. And Nomi's like, whoa, what was that? You know, it's like, <laughs> and they just played it at the moment. And it's like, you don't know what she was going to do. Right. <laughs> okay, well, let's see the first clip. Um, we have a few. And then we'll continue our conversation. That's lovely. You keep that. Oh, no, 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 I can't accept that. Yes, you can. I think we make a really good team. We do. I I'll work on this at home. You're crazy. I love it. So this is early on, maybe give a little context of what, where we are in this, in this part of the, well, of the this movie. This is right after the first scene where the girls are trying to come up with this ad campaign, ad campaign for this smartphone. Uh, and then the boyfriend comes and you can see there's some tension about, you know, uh, as, she, as the boyfriend kisses uh, Christine, you can see that maybe uh, Isabel has some designs on him also, another competitive thing being set up. And then she, you know, she gives her this scarf. The scarf plays through the whole movie. Uh, the one thing that I w wasn't too happy with in the Curnot film, there were five different clues to trap uh, Isabel in with the crime. And then, of course, once you laid the clues, then you had to explain later why they didn't catch uh, Isabel, why they were false clues. And this, you know, meant a lot of flashbacks and just put you to sleep. In any event, <laughs> I got it down to one scarf. And it starts at the beginning of the movie, there's the scarf. And the scarf is gonna go all the way through the movie. Now you worked with um, one of the original writers of the Carnot film, is that correct? And maybe talk about like some of the changes that you guys and how you work together and, and sort of making well, it, you're well, putting the Brian De Palma stamp on it. Well, Natalie, worked with Corneau on the original movie, Natalie Carter. And, and, and I worked on the script. I rewrote the script, and I rewrote it quite a few times. And then we got the cast. And then we got into the girls coming for rehearsal. Well, the girls had a whole different idea how to play the characters. So I had two actresses that 
had, I think, obviously looked at the original movie and said, we're not doing that. <laughs> Much to my surprise. So here we have a week of rehearsal, and suddenly the girls are sort of moving everything around, and I said, help! <laughs> you know, Natalie, get here. I can't be directing and writing this thing simultaneously. I need your help. So Natalie and I worked for a week rewriting the script uh, so that would fit more with the way the girls wanted to play the part. Were you okay with the fact that they were pretty headstrong on what, what they sort of... Uh, we had was, some tense know. moments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's what I was kind of wondering. Yes, yeah, I would imagine yes, that would be a little... we had many tense moments. Noby... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Noby used to send me these very long emails in the middle of the night with thoughts. Her thoughts. They went on for a couple of pages. <laughs> Here we are a week away from shooting and nobody has all these thoughts. Uh, so uh, that, that was a bit of a problem. We got in a big, we had in a, in a big fight over the mask. Oh, yeah. Nomi mm -hmm. did not like the mask. And I, I had designed this mask, I thought it would look great. But Nomi didn't like it and uh, so, I, you know, at one point I said, Nomi, put on the mask, we're using it. <laughs> and we got by the that mask, little the mask, crisis. Yeah, the mask plays quite a memorable, some memorable moments. Um, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, and some memorable positions, I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, do, you, do you generally like to have your own script that you work from, just generally speaking? It depends um, on the on movie. Them? I mean, I'm perfectly happy to, you know, direct other people's material, and it's good because it's their material and I could just direct it and then I've got my own nutty ideas and I like to make movies about that. I mean this movie is obviously about um, two women um, primarily um, and and you know as you were saying they have you know the two actors had quite a input I mean would you would it be fair to call this like a feminist movie? Oh I don't know is it a feminist <laughs> movie? Would a feminist like to stand up and either tear it to ribbons or defend it? <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> All right, we'll probably show clip uh, two in a moment here. Okay. Um, just that's my, the cue to go upstairs. Talk about the, like, the, the, the camera and the lighting. Um, you work with your cinematographer, Jose Luis Alcain. Yes. Yeah. Um, who is also no, known for, uh, works with Pedro Moldovar, yeah. right? Shoots right. all his movies. Yeah. Um, I mean, those, I mean the, the, the film has like, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, and I think, you know, kind of adds to the tension and the rivalry between Christine and Isabel. So maybe talk about just, uh, working with the, your cinematographer and stuff. Well, when you have such beautiful women, and I had a bunch of them, uh, I'm very, uh, how can I say it, intense about them being photographed correctly. And you need sort of a classic photographer that knows how to, how to photograph women. In fact, when I did Body Double, I auditioned the cinematographers, something that had never been done before. Mm -hmm. The idea of auditioning a cinematographer, well, I say, I've got these most beautiful women. If you can't light them, why do I want you shooting my movie? And, and when I knew I had this cast of these extraordinary looking women, I said, I gotta get somebody that really knows how to photograph women. And this guy's been photographing Almodar's women for decades. So that's why it looks so extraordinary. Yeah, it looks beautiful. All right, let's see clip two. Why? You knew about the memo. They want to change us. I thought they were wrong, so I did what had to be done. Everything happened really fast. I tried to update you last night, but you weren't answering Just answer phone. the question. Why? I watched you. I listened. I learned. I did exactly what you would do. There's no backstabbing here, Christine. <laughs> it's just business. Well, there it 
is then? Ooh. <laughs> there it is then. So maybe give a little bit of context for that scene. Well, uh, Christine has taken credit for Nomi's idea for this commercial for this for this smartphone, and uh, and then uh, and. And, and, and Isabel sort of takes it, and, and, and you know, and Christine says, oh, we all, we all work together. Uh, this isn't backstabbing. We're all on the same team. But this extremely successful commercial has gone viral, and, uh, and Isabel is going to get out of Berlin and be able to go to New York to the main office. Well, then there, of course, the, because the commercial is so radical, the company starts saying, well, maybe we should do it a different way. And then Isabel says, no, we're not doing it a different way. And, she's, and she defies Christine, and she uploads the commercial onto the internet, and it goes viral. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a big success, and the boss calls her up and says, yay, that commercial was great, and you did it, didn't you? And he says, well, I, yeah, I guess so. And then... It, Christine finds out that she's taken credit for her work, and then she says, well, that's okay, I guess. And then, you know, the vengeance is coming very soon. <laughs> um, in this film, you also use, at the moment, a, the split screen, um, which you've, uh, of course, used in the past with Carrie. Um, maybe just talk about that and like what, what, why you decided to use that for a um, pivotal moment in this. Well. In the original movie, Isabel's alibi is she was at the movies while all this was going on. Well, I have had, I have had this ballet of Jerome Robbins' uh, Afternoon of the Fawn that I've loved for years. I saw the original video of it on, uh, on the internet, and I said, I've got to put this in a movie somewhere. I mean, this is extraordinary. This is an absolutely beautiful ballet of Afternoon of the Fawn uh, that Jerome Robbins has choreographed. Uh, and this, gave, this film gave me the opportunity to do that because instead of going to the cinema, she's at the ballet. And I took this very tight close-up of uh, Isabel, so you think she's watching the ballet. Uh, meanwhile, over at the house, uh, uh, is, uh, Christine is getting ready to meet her mysterious lover. And I ran both images uh, against each other, and I said, well, this, is, this, this has never been done before, for, so let's hope it works, you know, because there's a kind of sexual tension in the ballet as there is with Christine meeting her lover, and of course, it ends up with Christine being killed. Mm. I, now, and correct me if I'm wrong, this, this was uh, made on film, is that correct? Yes. Yes, it was. Okay, because I think Redacted was digital. And I'm yes. just kind of curious, like, how do you fall? I know people have obviously very strong opinions um, on film versus digital. And sort of curious, you know, since well, you've done both now at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of ironic. We shot on film, but of course they release everything digitally today. Mm -hmm. So you're saying to yourself, why am I shooting this on film? You know, I might as well go completely digital. And that's, the tech, that's where the technology is taking you. And pretty soon there aren't going to be any labs to develop film anymore. So you better get ready for it. I know in, in, in the festival run, people have talked a lot about the score um, for this, and it's beautiful as well. I mean, we talk about that and creating it for this, and well, having this it fit is the mood. Like the seventh, I think, collaboration between Pino Dinaggio and myself. And we have a whole sort of language where we understand this kind of erotic thriller. And Pino uh, uh, responds well to the temp scores that I put in. And he, you know, comes up with something original when I suggest to him, you know, the kind of mood of the music I want for each section. Um, but this, you know, the last sequence, which is, you know, this incredible, with all these elements coming together, it's complete silent, goes on for seven to ten minutes. And he just has to generate this incredible, mm -hmm. you know, score in order to, you know, bring the emotional elements of the movie together. And it's, it's uniquely him. I mean, you know, and he did a fantastic job. Um, <coughs> of course, this is, as I mentioned, is a, is, is a remake. Um, and uh, I think just it's 
just getting completed, Carrie is being remade by Kimberly Pierce. So I'm wondering, like, how do you feel when about when one of your films gets a, like, a relook? <laughs> Somebody ripping off De Palma? <laughs> how can that be? Where would they get an idea like that? I know Kimberly Pierce. I, you know, I met her, God knows how many years ago, when she lived in New York. We used to go to the theater together. She's a very good friend of mine. She's an extremely talented director. And when she got this job, she called me. We discussed, you know, the way that she was going to do it. And I basically gave her all the advice I could and wished her good luck, you know? Uh, and seeing some of the visual stuff from the movie that's already out, it looks like she's doing an extremely good job. That's cool. Um, we're going to sh uh, show clip three in a mo clip three in a moment. Um, but I just want to ask you then, maybe just as a as a continuation of that, how how do you feel when you maybe haven't seen some of your older uh, work for a while and then go back and maybe look at it? How do you how do you relate to seeing them after maybe God, some time has passed? God, it's good. <laughs> how could they misunderstand me that way? Right on, okay. <laughs> with that, <laughs> we're gonna see God It's Good up here with clip three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for coming. Okay, I'll see you out. Thank you, take care. Isabel, I'm glad to see you wearing this scarf. Why don't we kiss and make up? Hmm? <sighs> So the third woman there is, just to give a little bit of a hint to your crowd here. The third woman is uh, Isabel's assistant, Danny, who's in love with her. And when she sees her being kissed by the evil Christine, <laughs> she's horrified. <laughs> And then you'll see what happens. All right, so I want to get to some uh, questions from the audience here, but just uh, one, maybe one or two for me as well before. Um, so bet you get your questions ready. Don't be shy. Um, so obviously you've worked within the studio system and outside of it. So maybe talk a little bit about that between the difference between the two. And then obviously this is set in Berlin. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if that was pr primarily a reason because of European financing um, or what was, ta-da, <laughs> I don't want to answer the, you, talk Isn't to us. Isn't it wonderful when they answer their own questions? <laughs> well, we were going to set it in London, yeah. but when we scouted all the locations in London, I said, what do, and we're going to shoot the interiors in Berlin because of the financing. Uh, I said, well, why don't we shoot the whole thing in Berlin, you know, I've seen these London locations before. Nobody's seen Berlin much. So why don't we do it in Berlin? They have some extraordinary architectural buildings there. And this will give it a new look. This is an international co uh, uh, corporation. It could be in Berlin or, you know, a whole bunch of different places. Berlin's a fantastic city. Yes, I mean, it yeah, is. And a great energetic and creative creative city. So, I mean, how was it just even working there once you, once you were actually just doing the shoot? Well, I know Tom Tickford very well. I saw his, you know, Run Lola One years ago in Montreal. We became friends, and I basically had his crew. Mm -hmm. and, and they were fantastic. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, let's start off with Q&A. Um, just a quick thing. There's someone with a microphone, and even though you may be able to yell really well, we're recording this, so we do need you to use a microphone, so please wait for that. We'll start here, and then we'll work our way back. Okay. Right here. Um, well, first, I want to say I think you should have been nominated for Best Director for both Sisters and Obsession. And... <laughs> 
I once heard Piper Laurie said that you let her go further than any other director had let her go. What specifically do you do to help your actors and actresses explore the full potential of their talent? Well, interesting you should bring that up. Uh, Piper thought she was making a comedy. <laughs> she said, you're going to throw utensils at me and crucify me? And she laughed uproariously. So, uh, I mean, I, I can't tell you, we had her strung up there with the utensils. Every time we <laughs> we hit her with, I don't know, a fork or a knife, you know, after we cut, she would burst out laughing. <laughs> so she, she, she brought this great strangeness and, and oddness to the character that uh, I think made it so unique. I mean, the thing about Piper is you don't quite know what's going on in that brain of hers. And she's very, very surprising and mysterious. And plus, she has this outrageous laugh. So it's, it's a combination that she brought to uh, the character of Mrs. White. Uh, Greg, right here. Um, <clears throat> you've worked with lots of different kinds of source material here, remaking something that was a previous film, carry a book. What do you, what do you prefer? Do you have any preference of the kind of source material you use? I mean, from your own scripts to other people's to uh, other media? And um, what do you think about the debate of the issue of sequels since you know there's always been over the years talks of various of your films with sequels? Well, I mean, you know, whether it's a novel or a play or you know, another movie, uh, if the material is really good, there's no reason not to keep remaking it in different eras. I mean, you know, uh, uh, American Tragedy was made, what, three different times? It's a silent version, there's a Bernd Sternberg version, and then there's the, uh, the, the famous version with uh, 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 Monty Cliff. So if you have great material, you know, it's always going to be great and it can be reinterpreted. We're directors. I mean, w you come from the stage, you're constantly directing great material that's being reinterpreted over and over again, so it's no mystery to me. Um, but, you know, it better be great material. You don't want to do hack material over and over again. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, uh, one right here, and then we'll go here, and then we'll go back. Uh, right in the middle here, and yeah. Hi, <laughs> I'm a pretty big fan, so it's so great to uh, be here. But um, I know you said that both Rachel and Numi were um, very opinionated actresses and very strong-headed actresses. Would you ever work with them again? Or are there any actors that you <laughs> really enjoy working with that you try to get on your films frequently? Or No, they're, they're, they're most actors and actresses, you know, have bring their talent and their opinions to what they're doing. The, the problem I had with both Numi and Rachel, they arrived a week before we were shooting. So we had to adjust the material really quickly. You know, and, and, I, and I talked to them afterwards. I said, girls, if you have some reservations about the way this is playing, please don't arrive a week before we're shooting because you know, we're scrambling like crazy just to keep up with you. So that was my only problem, and, we, and, and consequently from that, we got along fabulously. But normally, you know, really talented actors, you have to watch actors, they're all different. They have all different rhythms, they do things all different ways. When you say red, some actors are seeing red, and some people are seeing purple, and some people are seeing blue. And you better figure out what they're hearing based on what you're saying because uh, then you begin to understand them. And Kazan was very good about, you know, he would take actors out and talk to them and get a whole feel about the way they, uh, he, they understood him, which is kind of critical in directing. Any hint of what those reservations were? I'm just curious. <laughs> you were saying like the reservations that they had? 
the act the, uh, Naomi and, and Rachel. Well, I don't think they wanted to play the parts like the original. Okay. You know, they wanted mm -hmm. to do something different. Right. But the script was written with, mm -hmm. you know, the way those characters were envisioned in the Corno film. Mm -hmm. And they sort of arrived and said, we're going to do something completely different. We said, great, we've got a week. I guess we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right, let's go here, and then I'm going to go back and then swing around, OK? <laughs> What is your favorite movie? A uh, question I've been asked all day today. <laughs> you don't have an answer for that. I mean, you know, each movie has its own kind of emotional history. Uh, and uh, it's always been curious to me why people care what your favorite movie is. <laughs> Suppose I said it was Get to Know Your Rabbit. Would that make you feel any better? <laughs> is it, well, all right, at the risk of, of <laughs> at the risk of asking another question that you've been, you've been asked a million times, but is there something is there, are there some movies that are most memorable of actually having made while making them? Well, I would say there was a memorable time when I was making Scarface when we were shooting a scene between Al and Lopez and Manny in the office, and then we were supposed to continue the scene later that day when Al shoots all these people. And Al walked into the office and sort of looked around and tried to start the scene and then said, I think that we need to rehearse this. <laughs> well, I've got, you know, 200 people standing around. We're a couple of weeks behind schedule and Al wants to rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to think, what, what is the problem? I mean, we've rehearsed the scene backwards and forwards. And, uh, and then I went back with him as trailer and I was saw when we were rehearsing what he was doing. And I realized the problem he was having with the scene was the size of the room. The room, if you see the original scene in Scarface, they're just across a table and Lopez is talking to them. Then we had to build this whole other conference room with a huge table. So Al could move around the table as he was sort of executing one by one. And it was, you know, it's like sometimes the actor doesn't know exactly what's bothering him, but it was the space that was bothering him. And he wasn't sure what it was. He thought it was the scene. And we just, you know, we went and shot something else. We built a whole big conference room. And you see that scene in the movie today. And of course, he's fantastic in it. All right, this gentleman up here has been patiently raising his hands. So let's go up there and then we'll swing back around. Um, Wait for the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to take us back to Dress to Kill. The casting of Angie Dickinson and Michael Caine, were they always in your mind or was there a process that led to their selection? Well, I met Angie at the Montreal Film Festival, God, I think it's in 1979. And we had a lot of fun together. She's, she's a charmer, and uh, you know, I liked her immediately. Uh, and of course, I, you know, I, her movies are you know, some of my favorite, you know, Point Blank, and uh, to name just one. Uh, but so I had this idea, you know, you know, the Hitchcock idea of bumping the star off in the first 40 minutes, that was always the idea of Dress to Kill. So N Angie's the big dame, and that's who we're going to bump off. Uh, now Michael Caine was r represented by Sue Mangers, and uh, Sue was also my agent at the time. And Sue, you know, said you should use Michael, and she was right. <laughs> Good. Uh, right here. Hi, Brian. Uh, it's Harriet Helberg, and um, <clears throat> this is your interview, but I do want to say that Carrie was my favorite movie because you gave me the honor of casting it for you, my first film, and um, it's great to see you every 30 years. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful to hear your the way you speak about the actors is exactly the way I remember working with you, which was really a privilege. 
Uh, you still call the ladies girls. I mean, that's fantastic. And I know that you appreciate actors because you've always used brilliant ones. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I, I've been kind of binge movie going the last few days. And I noticed, um, I saw two, two films this weekend. One was very big budget. One was, I guess, a low budget, or low, what low is today, which I assume is 20 million. Um, and uh, I noticed that there are, uh, on the very big budget, there were um, 15 producers. On the lower budget, there were 13. And uh, if I remember right, although, you know, it's kind of hard to remember, there's a lot of brain damage in there, but I thought there was only one producer on Carrie. And I, I just wanted to know if, as a filmmaker that you are, if this is your experience now because of, as you said, you filmed the movie in uh, Germany because there was financing there. So is that why there are, I, I hope these 13 and 15 young men and women or old men and women are, are not uh, having a lot of say, shall I say, in, in what's going on in the films, but is that why there are so many? No, no, it's just that everybody that's involved in the financing, all the companies that are involved from the different territories, everybody gets some kind of executive producer credit. You never see those people for the most part. I mean, on the Black Dahlia, we had like a 15 producers. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't see any of them, except you know the only producer was Art Linson. He was the producer. And uh, so d don't, when you see all those names, it really doesn't mean anything. They just had something to do with the financing of the movie. Uh, in this movie, there was one producer, Saeed Ben Saeed. And, uh, and he was a very good producer. Uh, and uh, it's good to have a good producer with you. Uh, you know, this stuff, this stuff is, is hard to do. And, uh, and a good producer, you know, does a lot of... Uh, uh, things that uh, uh, better left to him rather than to you. Okay. I think you had a question, yeah? Hi, um, Nikolai, acting student from Austria. I was interested in the rehearsal with the actors. Um, I wanted to ask, do you usually like prepare one week or um, would you have preferred to uh, work more with the two? And um, I'd be interested, how did you work? Was it like improvisation or um, like did you go through the scenes um, what was it like well the problem with you know movie stars is that you know they don't have a, don't they don't give you a lot of time so consequently you know they arrive between pictures basically you got to you know put put them through makeup and costumes and rehearse them simultaneously we only had a week with uh, Nomi and Rachel so we had to sort of solve everything in that week. That is not the ideal situation. As opposed to a movie like Redacted, you know, when I created the whole, you know, platoon, the whole cast, I spent six months putting that cast together. We rehearsed everything backwards and forwards. And since the, mo since the part of the movie that I shot was just one continuous take, whether it was a video camera, surveillance camera, somebody using a, 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 you know, a digital camera. All, all their stuff was in one take. They, they had rehearsed the stuff backwards and forwards. They could have done this. I basically let them, and, we, and you're not concerned about how much film you're shooting, because they can just shoot until you, know, you can stick another cartridge in. So basically, I would do a scene. I remember the poker scene and redacted. Uh, you know, I shot it, you know, there was 29 takes. And I finally said, you want to do, and I, I did it until they were exhausted. I mean, they, they did it every conceivable way. So it's a whole different process depending on what kind of movie you're making. How long was the shoot on Passion? It was scheduled for 45 and I shot it in 39. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Tight pace. <laughs> Questions here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, microphone. And then I saw someone over there. Well, I just want to say I've waited 32 years for this opportunity to see you in person, and it's a pleasure to be here and to see you. And I want you to know that uh, I was with my girlfriend when I was 22, 
and I was in the audience when uh, Blowout was first released, and it was like a cinematic religious experience for me. And uh, even though I know with each film you get better and more uh, masterly, for me that'll probably always be my most favorite of your pictures. But uh, even though I have tons of questions about many of your films, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about the production design and Blowout. Some of the uh, Revolutionary War period characters have triangular hats which have a VI on it. And I was wondering if that VI was tied into uh, the climax when Jack Terry kills Burke and stabs him six times, or if that's too esoteric. <laughs> is, that, is that too esoteric or? Yes. <laughs> well, is, is there any significance then in, in that, or is that, am I reading too much into it? If there is, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's one of my favorites, and I'm really glad to Thank see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'll come back. I think I saw, yeah, one right, right over there. Um, I know you've uh, worked with uh, Al Pacino and Scarface and Carlito's Way, and uh, as I understand, you'll be working with him again in a, in a new film about Joe Paterno. And I'm just curious, uh, the first two being sort of tragic American stories, do you see your next film as like the completion of a trilogy of tragic American stories? And maybe can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, new production? Well, it, indeed a tragic story. And... Uh and it's a part Al wants to play. I mean, that's how it all started, you know. And it's a great honor to direct Al. He's, you know, one of the greatest actors of his generation. So in order to tell it in a fair way, I mean, it's sort of like Lawrence of Arabia. Everybody has a different view on what happened. So the, uh, the idea of the script is to try to re represent each re view equally and let the audience try to figure out what exactly happened and who is culpable. And right here. Uh, when a film is as, as major as this, I mean, do you have final cut? Uh, and if not, I mean, or, or if you do, I mean, is, is this the way you wanted it? Or, you know, did it have to be tweaked for commercial reasons or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, this question I've had for many years. Let me see. If I can put a new spin on it. Um, we're not working in the old Hollywood system. There isn't Louis B. Mayer, you know, telling us how to cut our movies. I came up with a generation of directors that suddenly they thought we were geniuses and we got something called Final Cut. It only lasted about a decade. We had a lot of fun and then it went back to the agents and the movie stars. Uh, yes, I had Final Cut. I've had Final Cut on all my movies, except for the very sad and tragic Get to Know Your Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one in the center and then we'll go to the back, okay. Um, right, his arm, oh, okay. Uh, just like uh, everybody else, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I've admired you for years, and uh, some of my favorites are uh, Body Double and um, uh, Dress to Kill. And, um, <laughs> and um, so, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, how did you get Melanie Griffith for uh, Body Double after the Annette, uh, Annette Haven, the adult film star, turn the roll down. Well, that's not exactly true. <laughs> the problem with Body Double was I could get nobody to play that part. And I auditioned only two actresses, Annette, who was an adult movie star, and Melanie, because I knew her very well because uh, she was Steve, uh, you know, the character in Starface, Manny's wife at the time, uh, Stephen Bauer. So, I mean, I couldn't get anybody to play this part. There was an extensive nudity, there's master, ba I mean, come on, it was impossible. 
And I, I do remember, I have a very distinct memory, <laughs> when I was doing these screen tests with Annette Haven and Melody Griffith, the head of the studio, which was now owned by Coca-Cola, I, I got an executive chasing me as I was going to this soundstage saying, you cannot be auditioning porn stars <laughs> on the Columbia lot. And, uh, of course, I went ahead and did the audition anyway. <laughs> what was interesting about Melanie and Annette is that uh, as though, as, as sexy as Annette is in her porn movies, there was no kind of play or, or, or beguiling aspect to her on film. And, of course, Melanie is just a fantastic, uh, sexy girl, which comes across on the screen. And uh, that was it. I mean, her test was fantastic, and from there on, we went and made the movie. Uh, right up there. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming in today, and thanks for delivering yet another intense and fascinating work of art. Um, I just saw it yesterday, so. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about the brilliant uh, long take that you made in Passion, where she walks through the corridor and into the elevator, which reminded me a lot of the long take in Snake Eyes, too, and just to hear more about your input and how you designed that shot. Well, it's very good for an actor to be able to play those emotions all the way through. You don't want to stop and start. I'll take a medium shot, then a close-up, then another shot when you're in the elevator. We'll take another shot when you're going down, because then I have to you know, create the emotion over and over again. What you want to do is let them play the emotion all the way till she gets to the car and freaks out. Uh, so I designed this shot, uh, which was you know, beautifully done by our cinematographer, uh, in which she could play the emotion, walking down, going, you know, that whole thing with the bag and f trying to pull her stuff together and, you know, you know, and the whole, you know, you can see her just falling apart until she gets to the car and the alarm goes off and she completely freaks out. And we did it in a couple of takes, but you have to rehearse something like that extensively, but it allows the actor to play, th I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the man with the golden arm, but Sinatra was a guy that liked to do like one or two takes, he was done. And his first take or second take was the best he ever do. And he had to do all these long, you know, things, you know, where he's going through all this withdrawal, you know, from heroin. And you can see how Preminger has choreographed it so that he can do all of this in one take. And you, again, Jean Arthur was a famous actress that was always good on take one or two. The big problem is when you have Frank Sinatra and Edward G. Robinson in a scene, because Frank Sinatra wants to go home after take two, and Ever G. Robinson is warming up on take 20. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one or, time for maybe one or two quick questions. We'll do one right here. Hi, Mr. Obama. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, as a camera person, uh, Video Village versus staying physically at the camera, watching the actor, in real life, it's something I've wondered about. Um, and the second question uh, is about Hitchcock, who we both love, obviously. This whole thing of Hollywood films being made about him now, I watch them regretfully. Um, and this controversy um, with the Tippi Hendren, and I, I'm not. Yeah, I, emotionally, I have trouble with that. I don't know if that's something you want to talk about, but um, whatever. But I'm curious about Video Village. I'm curious about Hitchcock's status, because it's someone I revere. Thank you. Well, Hitchcock's the great cinematic storyteller. I mean, any director will tell you that. Uh, and he, he did all these incredible things that, you know, we try to figure out how to improve upon them, but. It's kind of hard because they're so original. Uh, and he also has the advantage of remaining, you know, like I think Hitchcock made, what, 60 or 70 films? I mean, and, and starting in the silent era, I mean, that's the big problem today. I mean, these old classic directors that we revere, you know, have made, you know, tons of movies. 
I mean, and you get better and better when you, you know, are directing all the time. If you're a director, you should get out there and direct and stop and start thinking about what your next deal is going to be. Uh, these movies about, you know, Hitchcock and his relationship with the actors, I mean, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, it's like once you're a public figure, though they can basically write and make a movie about anything that sounds good, even though it may not be true. I, in, spa, in fact, one movie where the one uh, with uh, Helen Mirren playing Mrs. Hitchcock, mm -hmm. I mean, after I saw that, I said, gee, was she really kind of getting interested in this other screen? Did this really happen? You know, it's like then I had to go get the book and see if, you know, but who knows? You know, was she really interested in this other screenwriter and made Hitchcock jealous and this had something to do when he was making the movie of Psycho? You know, who knows? Okay. Uh, Pardon me, I'm sorry. The Video Village versus... Oh, I'm sorry. The Video Village. Well, the, the Video Village is, you know, we we're, we're all have, you know, digital assists on the camera. And, you know, you can look in front of a huge monitor and see how the scene's playing. That's not really what you should be doing. Uh, you should be next to the camera. You should lo be looking at the actors um, and studying exactly what they're doing. The closer you are to them, the better. And sometimes, you know, I do things like this so I can just see the actor and I'm not distracted by every, you know, everything else around me because I really want to focus on what they're doing. Uh, so that's, I think, the answer. Okay, final question. Back. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, you have a very distinct style, yet it never detracts from the story, the characters, or the plot. So how do you know when to use your uh, little camera tricks? <laughs> My little camera tricks. <laughs> Fifty years of filmmaking. <laughs> and I've reduced the little camera tricks? I pull that rabbit out of the hat anytime I can. 